Welcome back to Paper Things. Today we'll be reading chapters 28 through 31. Chapter 28, Forms. After I've served my detention, I take the bus to the Port City Library where Gage is going to pick me up. I'm not supposed to go back to Head Start until I've been free of the flu for two or more days. When I get to the library, I find a carol and pull out my application to Carter. On our way out of the school, Daniel had persuaded me that I should still at least apply. It doesn't cost you anything, he'd said, and I wondered how much he knew about my situation. And the worst that could happen is that you don't get in, which is what will definitely happen if you don't even bother to apply. He had some good points. There they are again, those spaces on the application that demand an address. I suppose I could write in Briggs's address, but that might get him in trouble. I could put down Chloe's address, but what if Gage and Chloe break up? I'm worried about that. We haven't seen much of Chloe lately, not since Gage got his job at Jiffy Lube. I wonder if they had a fight or if Gage is too proud to crash with her now that he should be able to afford a place of his own. I could write in Jana's address, but the last thing I want is my acceptance or rejection letter being sent to Jana's place. She'd want to know why I used her address instead of Briggs's, which she thinks is our address. And that's assuming she'd even bother letting me know that a letter came in the first place. We need an apartment. That's all there is to it. We need to figure this out. I look up at the clock on the wall. I still have an hour before Gage gets here. I walk up to Mrs. Getchell at the front desk and ask her for the address of the housing authority. The housing authority, dear? I nod. She doesn't say anything else. That's the great thing about librarians. They'll help you find information without being too nosy. She writes the address down on a scrap of paper and right away I recognize the street. It's quite far from here in one of the really pretty neighborhoods, which seems a little inconsiderate. Not only do most of the people who need to fill out forms with the housing authority likely need to pay to take the bus there, but then they have to pass by a bunch of beautiful homes that they'll never be able to afford. Why not place the housing authority office closer to the shelters? Is there anything else I can help you with, dear? Mrs. Getchell asks in a very kind voice. I decide to be brave. I need some housing forms so my family can get a voucher, I say, but I don't have the time or money to go all the way to the other side of the city. She thinks for a moment. Perhaps the forms are online. Why didn't I think of that? Do you want me to help you look? That's okay, I say. If they're online, I can find them. It costs 25 cents per page to use the printer at the library. I hope the forms are short. There's a lot to read on the Housing Authority site, and it looks like there's maybe even more than one program that Gage and I qualify for. They all have a waiting period, though, so they recommend applying to more than one at the same time. There's a faster program that would help us if we were living in the shelter, but unfortunately, living in the shelter isn't an option for us. I've just finished reading all of the information and have pulled up the voucher application form when Gage walks up behind me. What are you doing, Beniti? I found the housing authority forms. Gage looks over my shoulder and frowns. Didn't I tell you that I would take care of that? Yeah, but I thought... Come on, he says. He turns and walks back out through the double doors. I click out of the page, grab my backpack, and race after him. Wait up, Gage, I yell as soon as I'm on the street. He turns and faces me. Don't you think I want an apartment too? Don't you think that I am just as tired as you are of never knowing where I'm going to sleep each night? Don't you think I'm doing everything I possibly can? He starts walking. To where, I don't know. I'm just trying to help, I shout. No response. I was just trying to help, Gage. And I realize, as soon as the words are out of my mouth, that those are the same words Jana used all the time. I'm just trying to help, Gage. Gage 
hated Janice's help and told her he didn't need it, but she never stopped trying to give it to him. Maybe Gage resented the implication that he couldn't handle things on his own. Or maybe accepting Janice's help made Gage feel disloyal to Mama. I never did understand why Jana and Gage couldn't seem to get along. Why they were like two stubborn elk, butting heads and locking horns over every little thing. But as I walk behind Gage, I think back on the pictures in Jana's scrapbook. I think of the big secret I uncovered. Of our dad dating Jana before he married Mama. I wonder if Gage knew all about that. I wonder what else Gage knows that I don't. It turns out that we're going to Chloe's, which makes me happy. And once we're on the bus, Gage has cooled down, which also makes me happy. By the time we reach Chloe's house, he's back to being his old self. When we enter the building, he pauses to slip out of his Jiffy Lube jumpsuit and put on some deodorant. Can I use some, too? I ask apprehensively. He starts to laugh, but stops himself. Sure, he says, handing it over. But you'll smell like me. Then maybe we'll fall. Maybe Chloe will fall in love with me too. I tease, struggling a little to apply the deodorant with my shirt still on. Gage shakes his head. Come on, dork, he says, climbing the stairs to her apartment. You don't need deodorant to get Chloe to love you. She already does. But we'll see about getting you some of your own. Nate answers the door. Hey guys, he says. Chloe, company, he calls over his shoulder. Chloe's sitting on a bar stool in the kitchen. Next to her is a guy I've never seen before. Hey, Chloe says, jumping down from her stool and running to hug Gage. Did we make plans? She asks, looking confused. No, I just miss you. Gage looks over at the guy in the kitchen. Thought I'd see if I could take you out for dinner. Tonight? She asks. Gage's face falls, and I'm sure mine does, too. Yeah, tonight. You got plans? She nods reluctantly. Wyatt and I are working on a project tonight, she says, gesturing toward the mystery man. Do tomorrow, Wyatt adds. You don't have time to stop for dinner, Gage asks. But he and I both know that we didn't come here just for dinner. And I think Chloe knows it, too. I'm sorry, babe. We were just going to order in and work through the night, but you guys are welcome to stay if you want. Nah, we'd just be in the way, says Gage. We'll peace. Come on, Airy. Chloe gives Gage a kiss, but he pulls away after only a second. And just like that, we're back on the streets. Where to next, I ask. Briggs's? Gage doesn't say anything. His sour mood is back. Briggs's? I say louder. Gage shakes his head no. His landlord has him freaked out. Perry and Kristen's? I try to keep up with Gage. I don't know what's up with Perry. He hasn't answered my calls for a few days. Gage slows down. How about Sasha? Do you think you could stay with her tonight? I start to say no. Sasha's hardly talked to me in forever, but maybe I could tell her everything tonight. Maybe that would help get us back to being best friends. Do you want to call her? Gage asks. Feeling full of wishfulness, I take the phone. Mariana answers. Why, Airy, she says. Don't you have Sasha's new cell phone number? Or do old habits simply die hard? Hold on, I'll get her. Hey, Airy, Sasha says a few moments later. What's up? But there's no happiness in her voice. It's like she's a balloon and all the air has been sucked out of her. I feel my wishfulness starting to fade. Can I come over tonight, I say. It would be fun to catch up and I have something important to tell you. Can it wait? I have loads of homework. Plus, my mother is making me finish the Carter application. We could do it together, I say. I only just started filling out mine. There's a long silence on the phone. Um, I don't think so. Keisha and I had a long talk today, Ari, and well, she thinks... 
and I guess I agree that you've become kind of weird lately. You never invite me over to Janice anymore, and you're always hanging out with Daniel. I mean, you didn't even tell me about the snowflakes thing. What kind of friend does that? So I've been thinking that maybe we need to make other friends, especially since we're about to go off to different middle schools. Different middle schools? The words are like daggers. I can feel Gage looking at me and I turn away, blinking back tears. Anyway, I'm, I'm glad you called. I've been wanting to get this off my chest for a while, but you kept ignoring my messages. Messages I never got because the only number Sasha knew to call was Jana's. But it's too late to try to explain things now. She has already broken up with me. Yeah, okay, I say and hang up. No doubt Sasha and Keisha will be dissecting this call tomorrow, discussing how I didn't even say goodbye. I turn back to Gage and shake my head, handing him the phone. Gage doesn't say anything. We walk together in silence, the light growing dim around us. Let's get to the soup kitchen, he says, before it closes. I don't even bother to nod. I've already gone invisible. Chapter 29. Comics. Fortunately, the line outside the soup kitchen isn't long. I'm standing behind Gage waiting to enter the basement of the stone church and thinking about the first question on the Carter application. How would other people describe you? Holy moly, what a question. It seems to me that it would depend on who the other person was. I try to think of one-word answers that people I know might give. Gage, persistent. Mademoiselle, disappointing. Ms. Finch, sneaky. Mr. O, I'm not sure. Two weeks ago, he might have said irresponsible. But if I turn in my rough draft tomorrow, and if we stay at Lighthouse tonight, I sh should be able to finish it. He might change his word to hardworking. Mr. Chandler, delinquent. Sasha, this one's easy, weird. Daniel, I'm trying to carefully choose my word for Daniel when suddenly something or someone barrels into my legs. I nearly fall over. It's Omar. Where have you been? He demands. I'd forgotten that Omar's family sometimes comes here to the soup kitchen. I was sick, I tell him. I have to make sure that I'm all better before coming back to Head Start. Gage, who has been busy texting someone, Chloe, I imagine, or maybe Perry or Briggs, turns around just as Omar's mother comes up the line to get her son. Sorry about that, Ari, she says. He's been asking about you every single day. We told him you were sick, but I think he was afraid you'd disappeared. Oh, it's no problem, I say. I've missed him, too. But I should be back soon, I promise Omar. Omar and his mother move back in line to where his dad was holding a spot while Gage and I pass through the doorway. Inside, the line continues to weave along the wall until it reaches the serving table. Already, many of the tables in the center of the room are filled with people gobbling down their warm meal. I tried to see what's on their plates tonight, but I'm not close enough yet. I think about Omar as we meander closer and wonder if he and his family are living at the family shelter or perhaps one of the long-term motels. Chloe's roommate Cody once suggested to Gage that we rent a motel room, but Gage said that you end up paying so much money for rent and fast food, most hotels only have a microwave in the room if that, that it's nearly impossible to save enough money to move out of it. Good smells are coming from the kitchen and word has passed back to us that tonight's dinner is beef, vegetable soup, bread, corn dogs, salad, and dessert. What kind of dessert? I hear Omar say from somewhere behind me. I smile and shuffle forward with the line, almost ex as excited as Omar about tonight's menu. The earlier tension between me and Gage has eased with time, and even the sting of Chloe's rejection has dulled. Maybe tonight won't be such a bad night after all. 
And that's when I see her standing at the back of the room, ladling out soup to the masses is Keisha. As in Sasha's new best friend, Keisha, volunteering at the soup kitchen on the exact night when Gage and I decide to come by. I'm not hungry, I say to Gage, ducking behind him and hoping that Keisha hasn't already caught sight of me. What? Gage says somewhat loudly. I, I don't feel good. I'll, I'll wait outside. Do you want me to come with you? I peek around Gage's shoulder. Keisha's dad is looking over, but Keisha is busy proportioning out soup. I shake my head. I think I just need to get some fresh air, I say. Can you get me a plate, though? I changed my mind about being hungry, I say, and then hightail it out of there without waiting for an answer. On the street, I bump into Reggie and Amelia. Hey, Airy, he says. Coming to dinner? My brother is getting me food, I say. I needed some fresh air. I've been under the weather lately, I add, which isn't really a lie. Would you like me to watch Amelia while you eat? If you're sure you don't mind, Reggie says, I bet Amelia would like that. Reggie pulls a leash from his backpack. I take it from him intending to walk Amelia up and down the block a few times, but I don't get far because people keep stopping us. I'm amazed at how many folks on the way to the soup kitchen recognize her and want to give her a pat. An older woman and a boy about my age have both saved dog treats, the kinds that you get for free at the bookstore or the coffee shop. They've saved them for Amelia. It's getting cold and I'm beginning to see my breath when Reggie comes back and tells me that Gage is waiting for me on the steps of Lighthouse. I hope you're hungry because he's got quite a plate of food for you. I am pretty hungry, I realize. Thanks for letting me walk Amelia, I say, patting him on the head, patting her on the head one last time, reluctant to leave her side. Also, a small part of me is hoping that Reggie might ask if we want to stay in his storage unit tonight. I'm the one doing the thanking here, he says, smiling broadly. Just then, a young couple with a little baby approach us. Reggie, the woman says, hugging him warmly. The man shakes Reggie's hand while the baby gurgles at, at Amelia. Mary, Travis, I'd like you to meet my friend, Ari. Ari, this is Mary, Travis, and their daughter, Sarah. Nice to meet you, I say, feeling suddenly shy, like I'm a third wheel. I should have known that lots of people would know Reggie, too, if so many people knew Amelia. But somehow I guess I'd thought that he was my secret. Thanks again, Airy, Reggie says, and he walks off with the small family. As they go, I hear Reggie say, it's not the Taj Mahal, but it's warm. And I realize just as Reggie isn't my secret, neither is his little home. I picture the family of three all warm and snugly there, probably with Amelia too. Gage is right where Reggie said he'd be. He's spread out on the top step of Lighthouse, a bowl of soup on each side of him and a takeout bag in his lap. He lifts up one of the bowls and I plunk down beside him. That girl serving tonight, she someone you know? He asks. I nod. Keisha, Sasha's new BFF. Do you think she saw me? I doubt it. You ducked out of there pretty quick and she really wasn't looking at the faces of the people in line. I sure hope Gage is right. The last thing I need is for word to get out that I eat at the soup kitchen. People would start asking uncomfortable questions and it would probably be just a matter of time before someone thought to check in with Jana. Not to mention the fun Keisha, Linny, and Sasha would probably have gossiping about me being dirty, smelly, and someone who eats with the homeless. West comes out when we're nearly done eating. Hey, man, he says to Gage, and they do some elaborate handshake thing. Hey, Airy, he says to me. Hi, West, I say around my last bite of apple pie. Listen, Gage, he begins, sounding a little nervous, which of course makes me nervous too. Is he going to tell us that we can't stay here tonight? What's up, Gage asks, and I can tell that he's trying hard to sound nonchalant. There's a new supervisor on tonight, Wes says. 
I don't think I can sneak you into the storage area with him on watch. You'll have to register. But Aerie isn't old enough, remember? says Gage. I'll leave her age blank when I fill out the paperwork, says West. It will look like an oversight. I frown. Gage and I will have to sleep in separate rooms? West nods. You'll be okay, Aerie. The girls who come here in the middle of the week are typically well-behaved. They know they'll be asked to leave if they're not. But what if someone under 18 wants Gage's bed? That's the rule at Lighthouse. Anyone between 18 and 20 has to give up his or her bed if a minor needs it. Then he'll have to give it up, West says. But if I know Gage, he'll figure something out and be back for you in the morning. I look at Gage. He looks so tired, like he can't take one more step tonight. It'll be okay, he says. It's only one night, and if it comes to it, I'll just crash at Chloe's place. I hold his gaze, trying to see if he's lying to make me feel better, but I can't tell. I shrug. What choice do I really have? I gather up our trash and follow the guys inside. Gage goes into West's office to check us in. I'm left in the living room with a group of five teenagers, three girls and three boys. I sit down at the table that's off to the side and try to become invisible. As I wait for Gage to be done, I think again of Keisha and how she and Sasha seem to have become best friends in no time flat. How was it possible that Sasha could ditch me so quickly and become best friends with someone she'd barely spoken to till a few weeks ago? I'm reminded of, of a math game we played in third grade called Mingle. We'd all stand and buzz around one another like bees, mumbling, mingle, mingle, mingle. Then, when our teacher called out a number, we had to quickly form ourselves into groups of that number. It was a way of explaining division and remainders. If you weren't fast at grabbing friends, if you didn't get into a group of two or three or four, you were a remainder. Now that, now that school's nearly over, there seems to be a game of mingle going on. Kids know who will likely go to Carter, to St. Anthony's, or to Wilson. They're grabbing one another and holding on, counting on an alliance when they get there. Sasha and Keisha have found one another. Catherine McCauley, another girl headed to St. Anthony's, has grabbed onto Linny, but I don't have anyone. Right now, I'm a remainder. Eventually, Gage and West come out of the office, and it's time for us to find beds on our separate floors. I want to ask West if there's really a bed for Gage or if they're just going through the motions for my benefit, but I don't dare. Besides, I'm not sure I want to know the answer. West and Gage stay behind on the second floor, and I give Gage a quick hug before I turn to head up to the girls' floor. I'll meet you in the kitchen at seven for breakfast, Beniti, Gage calls after me. I nod, but don't turn back. I'm afraid he'll take one look at my face and know how scared I am to sleep on the third floor without him in a room full of strange girls. Even though there can't be more than seven girls in the room, the maximum is eight, and West assured me that there was a bed for me. It sounds like there are, are about twenty girls in there. I enter the room slowly, taking in as much as possible, as quickly as possible, and trying to find an empty bed. Hey there, one of the girls says, spotting me. She's blonde and pretty, maybe a few years younger than Gage, but definitely older than me. Most of the girls are a lot older than me, I notice. The next youngest girl seems to be about 14, and she's sitting on a bed with two older girls who look just like her. Sisters, I bet. Hi, I say quietly, making my way over to a bed that seems to be empty. I set my backpack down on it cautiously, half expecting someone to yell at me and tell me I'm taking her spot, but no one does. You here by yourself? the blonde girl asks. I shake my head. My brother is on the boys' floor. He's 18, I add, somehow feeling a bit safer for having said this. The girl nods. Well, if you need anything, just ask. I'm Cassie. I'm here most nights, so I know the ropes. This here is Delia, and that over there is Jordana. 
and those are the O'Reilly sisters. The other girls mumble greetings, and I relax a little, settling back on my bed and opening my backpack. This isn't so bad. If I can tune out the sound of the girls' chatter, I might even be able to finish my report before lights out, which is at 10. I'm scribbling away in my notebook and flipping through the pages of Little Women when the youngest O'Reilly sister comes over to my bed. I look up at her and smile, not wanting to seem unfriendly, but then I look back down at my book, hoping it's clear that I'm trying to work. But the girl just stands there, not saying anything. I try to ignore her, but it's hard to concentrate with her hovering in front of me. What does she want, anyway? What's that? she asks. I look up again. She's pointing at my paper things folder, which I took out of my backpack to get to my report. A few pieces of furniture and two of the people, a teenage boy named Alex and the toddler in the snowflake sweater, who doesn't have a name yet, they peek out from the sides of the folder. Oh, nothing, I say, opening the folder a crack and sliding the clippings back inside. I've barely closed it again when the girl snatches it up. Hey, I say, reaching for it, but she turns so that it's too far away. Cool, she says, flipping through the folder. Are these like paper dolls or something? Her sisters gather around to see what it is that she's found, and soon Cassie and Jordana come over too. I stand up and try to grab the folder back, but the girls block my way. What is all this stuff? Cassie asks, laughing. Now they're picking out their favorites and passing them around. My heart feels like it's lodged in my throat. Please give them back, I say, but my voice is a squeak. What happened to him, says Delia, holding Miles so everyone can see. The Adventures of Tape Man, she says, flying him around like he's a superhero or something. I want to scream, give him back, but I know that will only make all of them more furious. So I smile like a stupid mannequin. Look, says one of the O'Reilly sisters. She's drawn earrings on one of my teens, long dangly earrings. The girls laugh and suddenly everyone seems to have a pen. I'll take her, someone says and grabs Natalie. Ooh, give me him, another girl says, snatching Alex from the pile. Soon everyone is doodling on my paper things, adding eyeglasses, tattoos, earrings, and other things that I can't bear to even think about. Hot tears burn my eyes. Gage, where's Gage? I want to scream out his name like a little kid would cry mom, but he's not here. And even if he were, it's too late for him to do anything. My paper things are already ruined. Hey kid, don't look so grim, Cassie says to me. We're just having a little fun. She hands me the people she's defaced. Mandy and Tamara and even little Nikki, and the other girls follow suit until I have everything back. Clearly the fun has worn off for them. I stuff my paper things back into my folder numbly, trying not to look too closely at any of them. Four years of collecting and imagining and caring, gone. Just like that. I shove the folder in my backpack along with my unfinished report and my notebook and I climb into bed, not even bothering to take off my uniform. Lights out isn't for another half hour, but I don't care. Right now, I don't care about anything. Chapter 30, Dollar Bills. I stay awake for hours listening to the sounds of the other girls in the room. They don't seem like bad girls. I think dimly at their conversations. I think that dimly as their conversations wash over me. They talk about school and boys and which shelters have the comfiest beds or the best breakfasts. They probably didn't mean any harm when they drew all over my paper things, and it wasn't exactly like I was shouting at them to stop. But whether they meant harm or not, they had no right to do what they did. And I can't help thinking that I hate each and every one of them. Eventually my eyes get heavy and I drift off to sleep. But it's a light sleep and that turns out to be a good thing because suddenly in the darkness I hear Gage's voice. 
At first I think I'm dreaming, but then the actual words penetrate, just barely distinguishable through the thin walls. My sister is upstairs, Gage says to someone. Can you make sure someone tells her? I bolt awake, grab my backpack, and fly down the stairs. Gage is opening the front door when I call out his name. Airy, he says, then quickly lowers his voice. What are you doing up? I heard you talking, I say, slipping my backpack over my shoulders. I figured you were leaving. Yeah, the room filled up, but I thought you agreed to stay here. I gave him a look that says, don't even try to talk me into staying. Grab that blanket, he says, pointing to the one that's been unfolded on the couch. I nab it and we're out the door. The night is frigid and within minutes I can't feel my feet, but I know better than to complain. Besides, I'm too tired to do much more than follow Gage up the hilly roads. This time he doesn't race ahead of me. He holds out his hand and I take it. At this hour, the city is much darker than I have ever seen it before. I look up as we walk and see stars. With the stars overhead and Gage's warm hand holding mine, I feel safe and protected, and I know that everything will turn out okay. Soon I realize that we're headed toward Chloe's. Just as I'm starting to worry that she might be upset to have us knock on her door in the middle of the night, we stop in front of her forest green car. What are we, where are we going? I start to ask, wondering when Chloe gave, gave Gage her car keys but Gage doesn't answer. Instead, he takes a long, thin piece of metal from his back pocket and uses it to unlock the car door. Thank goodness her car is so old, Gage says as he opens the driver's side door. You can't do this on new cars. They've got computer systems and alarms. I stare at the open door, still trying to make sense of what's happening. Come on, Gage says, motioning for me to get in and crawl over to the passenger side. You're letting all the cold air in. As I slide into the seat, I think about the kid Chloe pays to protect this car. I sure hope he's sleeping right now. I'm expecting Gage to do something to the ignition and drive us somewhere. Briggs's place, maybe, or Perry and Kristen's. But instead, he reclines his seat as far back as it goes, and he settles in. And I finally get it. We're sleeping in Chloe's car. I recline my seat, too, and cover up with the blanket. I'm cold to my bones and worry that Gage may be even colder without a blanket. But without a key, it's impossible to turn the heat on. I try to share the blanket. Nah, I don't need it. Let me teach you a trick, he says. Close your eyes and picture a little candle in your belly. I look at him like he's crazy, but he just nods. Go on, do it. Slowly I let my eyes droop closed and then I think of a candle in my belly, just like he said. Concentrate on the flame, he says, his voice soft and warm in the cold, dark air. Imagine the flame growing bigger, stronger. Feel the heat move from your belly to other parts of your body, down your arms and legs, into your hands and feet. Now. Feel it moving up your neck and warming your face. I do what he says, and holy moly, it actually works. I do feel warmer, like a little flame is moving throughout my body. I only shiver when I stop concentrating. Between the late hour and the fact that we just walked across half the city, you would think that Gage and I would fall right to sleep, but neither of us does. We stare up at the sky through the moonroof on the car. I wonder what Gage is thinking. If he's wishing he weren't so full of pride that he could just go and knock on Chloe's door, or if he's upset at having to give up, give up his bed at Lighthouse for some stranger. My own thoughts swirl around drifting from my ruined paper things to Sasha and Keisha and Linny and on to Daniel and the Eastland traditions and Carter. Eventually, though, they settle on one thought, and I find myself speaking in the dark. Did you know that Dad dated Jana before he married Mama? I ask Gage, my voice sounding low in the silent night. What? No way, he says. What makes you think that? 
I tell him about Jana's scrapbook and about the pictures of Jana and our dad. How do you know it was dad? You never even met him. It was, Gage, I said. It was the same man as in Mama's wedding pictures. It was someone who looked exactly like you. Weird, he says, though I can tell that he doesn't fully believe me. I can't really blame him. I, I saw the pictures and I can still hardly believe it myself. And then something occurs to me, something that feels so right that I wonder if this was why my brain was fixating on these those pictures. Maybe some of Jana's grouchiness, some of her having to be better than Mama, had more to do with Dad than with you. Gage grunts, but I can practically feel the wheels in his head working away, turning over this new information and trying to make sense of it. After that, he's quiet for a bit. So quiet that I wonder if he's fallen asleep. But then he speaks up. I know you're looking forward to us having our own place, and I am too, but West was telling me about this group house that we might be able to move into. It's called a stability house, and you pay only a small amount of rent with the rest of your money going into a savings account to help you pay for a future apartment. And the program lets you take classes or even attend college so you can find an even better job. I haven't heard Gage this excited since he got his job at Jiffy Lube. Who else would live in the house, I ask? The family house is filled right now, but they're trying to put together a new house with 18 to 20 year olds. But I'm only... West is working on getting you a room in the house too. I think about living in a house like that. It wouldn't be like having a real apartment, one you can decorate, one where you can spread out your things and leave them, one where you can stand in front of an open refrigerator door and know that all the food inside is yours for the taking. I'm not even sure you'd have privacy. The stability house sort of sounds like the shelter, only there would be the same people every night. I think of the girls back at Lighthouse and my folder of ruined paper things. It sure would solve a lot of problems, Gage says. I want to be as excited as Gage sounds to reassure him that I'll be happy anywhere as long as we're together, but I'm filled with doubts and fears. What will I do on nights when you want to go on a date with Chloe, I ask. Will I stay at the house? By myself? What will I tell my friends? I can't exactly invite them over for sleepovers at a group home. Not that I have any friends anymore, I think. And maybe Gage thinks that too, but he's nice enough not to say anything. We'll cross that bridge when we come to it. If we come to it, Gage sighs. But it sure would help things if Chloe could stop thinking of me as homeless. I raise myself up on my elbows. You're not... We're not homeless, I say. But Gage is quiet, so I say it again. We're not homeless. Think about it, Aerie. What does it mean to be homeless? I think of the people that I pass on the streets, the one who are huddled against buildings or standing on curbs asking for money, sometimes talking to themselves. They're homeless. I think of the girls at Lighthouse who drew all over my paper things and talked about which shelters had the nicest beds. They're homeless too. But then I think of Reggie and Omar and the young family with the baby. Homeless people are people who don't have homes, I say slowly. Right, says Gage. Like us, I realize. Chapter 31, Gift Wrap. In the morning before the bell for homeroom, I do something I've never done before. I sneak into the cafeteria for free breakfast. Jana always insisted that we start the day with a good breakfast, even when Gage swore that he wasn't hungry, that his stomach didn't want a thing. And then, when we were living with friends, I'd eat whatever they ate for breakfast. Cheerios at Briggs's, frozen waffles at Chloe's. Lighthouse gives the kids granola bars and juice in the morning. But this morning, I've had nothing, and I'm starving. The hardest part turns out not to be getting the food. Apparently, at breakfast, no one checks to see if you've signed up or if you're even approved. It's easy for me to slide in and take a tray with scrambled eggs and home-fried potatoes. 
The hardest part is figuring out where to sit. I look around the room and realize that I've never thought about who comes to the cafeteria before school starts. Given that we all have this one thing in common, I should feel relaxed and friendly, able to sit with whoever catches my eye. But instead, I, I feel oddly shy and embarrassed, like everyone in this room knows that I'm not really supposed to be here and resents me for it. I sit down at the end of one table close enough to some kids that I don't feel like I'm all alone, but far enough away that I don't invade their space. Then I open up one of Louisa May Alcott's books and I start to read. Even though I've read every page of this book already, I still read. I notice then that the book is overdue and realize I'll have to raid my piggy bank at Briggs's place to pay the fine. Gage and I left the car just as the sun was rising this morning, partly because we were so cold and we needed to move around and partly because Gage was afraid Chloe would catch him in her car. So after breakfast, I still have plenty of time to go to the girls' room to freshen up. I go into the handicap stall and change into a clean shirt and uniform, rolling up the stuff I wore last night and cramming it into my bag. It's smelly and hopelessly wrinkled already, so a few more wrinkles won't hurt it. I head to the sink to wash my face and maybe sneak in a quick sponge bath of my underarms with wet paper towels. When I look in the mirror and see my reflection, I groan. I have dark circles under my eyes and my hair's a mess. I can just imagine what Sasha and Keisha are going to say about that. Just then, someone else slips into the bathroom. It's a girl from my class that I recognize, though we hardly ever speak. Hey, Hannah, I say, turning on the water and washing my hands like I had just used the toilet. Hey, Ari, she says then yawns hugely. Oops, sorry, she apologizes, laughing. I keep the water running while she uses the toilet, washing my face as quickly as I can, hoping to finish before she comes out and sees me. I don't dare wash my underarms, though. Thankfully, a quick whiff assures me that they're not too bad today. Not yet, anyway. Hannah comes out of her stall while I'm patting my face dry with paper towels. I'm about to toss them in the trash can and hurry away when she says to me, You know how to braid, right? I feel heat rising from my belly to the tip of my ears. Her tone may not be as nasty as Keisha's, but I can tell that what she's really saying is, Why don't you braid your hair instead of letting it tangle into a total rat's nest? You used to have the coolest braids, she says, coming up to the sink next to me and washing her hands. Do you think you could braid my hair this morning? I have a comb and a bunch of elastics in my backpack. I try to hide my surprise. I'm not very good at it, I admit. Jan someone else used to braid my hair, but I can try. I stand behind her and carefully comb the snags out of her hair, relieved to know that I'm not the only girl at Eastland Elementary with snarls. I gather her hair into sections and try my best to make straight parts. It turns out that braiding someone else's hair is tray easier than trying to braid your own, and I'm pretty happy with the results. I can tell by Hannah's smile that she's happy too. Thanks, she said. My mom used to do my hair in the mornings, but ever since she switched to the night shift, she'll usually she's usually asleep when I leave for school. I know what you mean, I say. Jana hasn't been around lately to do my hair either. This is one of those statements that's not really a lie, but isn't exactly the truth either. But I want Hannah to know that I understand what it's like not to have a mom around to do things for you. Would you like me to try to do yours? Hannah asks. I'll warn you though, I don't have a lot of experience. She smiles again and it's contagious. That's okay, I say, grinning and turning around. I can walk you through the trickiest bits. And then, for some unknown reason, I tell her, I had breakfast here this morning. It wasn't half bad. After announcements, Mr. O tells us that the fifth grade teachers had their grade level meeting yesterday. We know what's coming. Some of us sit up straighter, which is pretty funny. Do we think that our good posture will make our names magically appear on Mr. O's list of students who got leadership roles? I look around the room trying to determine who has yet to be patrol leader. The role I really, really, really want, though I'd take any job offered to me right now. 
This is the last time that these announcements will be made this year. Mr. O announces the library helper. It's Matthew Stone. He pumps his fist and then relaxes back into his chair. Some of the kids sitting up straight won't even be applying to Carter, but maybe there are other reasons for wanting to be patrol leader. Jana always seemed to know when the new leadership roles were announced. I wouldn't be in the, in the house for more than a few minutes when she'd ask, who's patrol leader next month? I felt bad when I admitted that I hadn't been chosen, like I was letting her down. Maybe others like me are hoping to avoid that same old question in the same old way. I don't think Gage thinks about me in leadership roles. I don't think he realizes how hard it is to get into Carter. I think he just assumes that I'm smart, so I'll go. Joya and Ellison are chosen as math tutors, which seems especially unfair since I've often been asked to show them how to do something in math. I guess I'm not as smart as we thought I was. Or maybe I'm not as smart as I used to be. Sanjay and Thalia are patrol leaders, the last patrol leaders of the year. Fifth grade is almost over, and I will never, ever, ever be a patrol leader. Never. Makes me glad that I don't have a scrapbook. In social studies class, kids who are finished with their reports early, thank goodness they aren't officially due until next week, are giving presentations on their famous 19th century Americans. Linny shows us a poster she made about Davy Crockett, who was known as the King of the Wild Frontier. Next, Sanjay tells us about a man who lived more than a hundred years ago named Henry David Thoreau. I sit up taller in my chair to listen when I hear that Henry David Thoreau was a friend of Louisa May Alcott's. He was also an author, but Sanjay is talking about he, how he believed in something called civil disobedience. I repeat the words in my head, trying to puzzle out the meaning, but I don't think I quite get it. When Sanjay asks, are there any questions, I raise my hand tentatively and say, what exactly is civil disobedience? I hear Keisha snicker behind me, but I try to ignore her. I bet she doesn't really know what it means either. Good question, Ariana, Mr. O says, and I'm glad I asked it. Sanjay? Civil disobedience is when someone breaks a law to make a point, Sanjay says, and you can tell that he knows a lot about it. Henry David Thoreau didn't pay his taxes because he didn't believe in slavery, and he didn't support the Mexican-American War. Back then, part of everyone's tax money went to fund both of those things, so by not paying his taxes, Thoreau was sending a message. I'm going to refuse to do homework because I don't believe in it, Joey says. Does it have to be a law, I ask, ignoring Joey. Is it civil disobedience if you break a rule? Like when you hang snowflakes even though your principal has abolished the Eastland tradition, says Mr. O. He smiles right at me. I smile back, one proud moment lifted from my sack. Or wear a crazy hat to protest the loss of traditions? We should do that, Keisha says. We should all wear crazy hats on the same day to let Mr. Chandler know that we believe in our traditions. It could be an act of civil disobedience. I open my mouth to say that I am already planning to do that, that I need to organize it so that I can put it on my Carter application, but everyone is too busy talking excitedly about the secret crazy hat day. And just like that, I'm invisible. The tiredness hits me after Mr. O's class and gets worse throughout the day. By the time my last class, computer lab, rolls around, I can hardly keep my eyes open. Ms. Finch teaches us how to make multimedia presentations using animation, audio clips, and video clips. The stuff she shows us is actually tray cool, and I might even be able to enhance my Louisa May Alcott presentation with clips from the movie version of Little Women, or an animated slideshow of the various places she and her family lived before settling in Concord, Massachusetts. If only I could focus. Ari, 
Would you mind staying for a few minutes at the end of class? Miss Finch asks quietly as she walks by my workstation. My heart plummets. Did I actually shut my eyes? Is she still mad at me about sneaking into the lab that one time? I'm wide awake for the rest of class, but now it's anxiety rather than tiredness that keeps me from focusing on the lesson. When the bell rings, I stand by the door and wait for everyone to leave. Daniel gives me a searching look, but I tell him that I want to ask Miss Finch something about today's lesson. Thankfully, he doesn't offer to stick around. Okay, I'll see you tomorrow, he says, and heads off. When it's just me and Miss Finch in the room, she walks over to her desk and retrieves a paper bag from the bottom drawer. I was thinking of you recently, Airy, she says, opening the bag. I'm holding my breath, wondering where this is going. You see, I bought my niece a new pair of shoes, but they didn't fit her. I swear that girl grows six inches each time I see her. Anyway, you'll probably think I'm crazy for saying this, and I might be way off base, but for some reason they reminded me of you. If you like them and they fit, you're welcome to have them. She pulls a pair of plaid topsiders from the bag. They are without a doubt the cutest pair of shoes I have ever seen in my whole life. She hands them to me. I hold them in both my hands, aware that my mouth is hanging open, but unable to close it. Miss Finch was giving me a free pair of shoes, of really cute shoes. Why me? Surely lots of girls in her classes might like these shoes and might be the right size for them. Was it because she'd noticed that my shoes were falling apart? Were these pity shoes? Or did she really mean it when she said they reminded her of me? Try them on, she says. My fingers barely work as I pull off my old shoes and I wonder if everyone has noticed how ratty they are. Slowly, I slip one foot into the top siders, then the other. I wiggle my toes around. They're the perfect size. Maybe this is an act of charity and maybe Gage would want me to say thanks, but no thanks. But looking down at my feet in these brand new tray cool shoes, I decide I don't care why Miss Finch is giving them to me. I'm just grateful that she is. And suddenly I'm crying. What's wrong, Airy? she asks, her voice gentler than I've ever heard it before. Why are you crying? That's just what I do, I say, sniffling and smiling through my tears. I cry when I'm happy, and these shoes make me very, very happy. Thank you, Miss Finch. Now it's Miss Finch's turn to get a bit teary. You're very welcome, Ariana. What should I, if someone asks, tell them a friend gave them to you, Miss Finch says. It's the truth. I give her a big thank you smile, then tuck my old shoes into my backpack. I turn to leave, but stop myself. I'm sorry about that day in your class, the day I was working on my bibliography. Oh, she says, brushing my words away. I may have overreacted. I shouldn't have taken your action so personally. I realized that after you left. That's why I passed your homework on to Mr. O'Neill. It was Miss Finch who turned it in? I want to rush over and hug her, tell her that she saved my life, but before my new dazzling feet can move, she's behind her desk, glasses on, back to work. I feel like Cinderella in my new shoes. During dismissal, kids tell me how cool they are and ask where I got them. Tell them a friend gave them to you. It's the truth. So that's what I do. I wish Sasha and I still had our partway walk home. I would have liked for her to see them, but I'll wear them tomorrow and every day after, so I suppose she'll see them soon enough. My new shoes are also a big hit at Head Start. Juju keeps rubbing her hands on them like they're magic or something, and Carol tells me I look very fashion-forward. The one person who doesn't love my new shoes is Gage. You could have used the money in your piggy bank to buy shoes, he says, as we're walking to Chloe's. I think about my piggy bank and wonder how much money is in there. Would there really be enough for a new pair of shoes? I start daydreaming about all of the apartment stuff I could buy with that much money, 
silverware, towels, sheets. Anyway, I like them, I said to Gage, ignoring his bad mood, and they'll keep my feet warmer than my old shoes. Today, the stairwell at Chloe's is crowded with a bunch of guys, spillover from some party happening in the apartment below hers. The strong scents of their shaving creams and hair gels cover the usual smell of pee. Hey, says a guy about Gage's age, but he doesn't say it to Gage, he says it to me. He takes a drink from a can of beer. Hi, I mutter, my eyes on the stairs in, in front of me, not on him. Hey, how old are you? Another guy asks as we climb the stairs. Don't answer, says Gage softly. Chloe greets us in the doorway, seeming really excited to see us. Like usual, I slip inside the apartment to give them a moment. Neither Nate nor Cody is home. The apartment seems, seems empty without them. I hear Gage say, I want to, Chloe, but I can't. I don't want to leave Ari alone with those creeps downstairs. She doesn't need someone to watch her. She's old enough to be a babysitter, Gage, and it's not fair to keep asking me to pass things up or to go alone. I hate that I'm the reason Chloe and Gage are fighting. I don't want them to break up. Gage is trying to come through for Chloe, to come through for me, and to come through for Mama. Stay together always. That's what Mama said. That was the promise. But I think that both Gage and I know deep down that it's not the promise that's making us hold on to each other so tightly. It's the fear of letting go. I can't hear what Gage is saying, but I know he's upset. Quickly, I step into the hall. Sorry to interrupt, I say, but I just remembered that Sasha invited me to stay at her place tonight. Would that be okay? Chloe looks at Gage, hopeful, but Gage frowns. It's a school night, he says. I know, I say, but Mariana said we could work on our Carter applications together. I could really use the help. Gage, Chloe pleads. I try not to feel hurt by how badly she wants me out of their hair. Chloe and I could have plans tonight, he says slowly, and Chloe's face splits into a wide grin that makes it all worth it. We'd have to leave soon, though, he says. I wouldn't have time to take the bus with you to Sasha's. That's okay, I say quickly. I can have Mariana pick me up here. I'll tell her Chloe was helping me with my Carter application. Thanks, Airy, Chloe says. You're a trooper. She brushes by me to get her purse and her phone. I can't believe I didn't remember earlier, I say, but she asked me a couple of days ago and I sort of lost track of what night this is. Gage is looking at me like he doesn't know whether to believe me or not. Call Mariana and make sure she can pick you up, he says. I hold out my hand for his phone. Use the landline, says Chloe, pointing to the telephone on the kitchen counter. You'll save minutes. I pick up the phone and dial. What's the address here? I ask at some point in the phone call. The call that I made to convince Gage. The call that I faked because I was just talking to the local weather recording. That is the end of chapter 31. We'll be back next week for more chapters of the book Paper Things.